when it comes to Giuseppe Pinone, the term pioneer really fits perfectly the notion of the relationship between nature and culture and how contemporary art can help us to understand what we need to reconfigure, how we need to rethink our relationship with nature and culture. For those of you who don't know Giuseppe Pinone, he is um, a quintessential unconformist artist in a number of ways. He was born in Garesio, a small time, a small town close to Turin in Piemont in 1947. And he studied at the Academy of the Beaux-Arts in Turin. Of course, his very early experimentations in the field of art, contemporary art of the time, are linked to Arte Povera. Arte Povera is one of the most important movements in the history uh, of the West. It is, of course, a, an important chapter, an incredibly important chapter in the history of Italian art, but it is also an extremely influential movement across the spectrum in contemporary art. I actually remember um, truly understanding how influential Arte Povera has been over the past 60 years. Only when I moved to London in the late 90s and realized how famous it was abroad. It's a classic of Italian culture where we don't actually have a, a rounded understanding of what's really well known and appreciated abroad. And sometimes we underestimate the influence of what uh, Italy has contributed to the, the cultural international scene. I remember a beautiful exhibition at Tate dedicated to Arte Povera that really mapped important territory in that context of international influence. And you will remember that Arte Povera was an incredible movement, a rejection, a substantial rejection of the tradition of classical art that, of course, I think it makes perfect sense to think about Italy, its heritage, what country, what uh, reality, creative reality, more than Italy could have produced a movement that rejected the classical notion of materiality as well as aesthetics, uh, as Arte Povera. So works like the kind that Alighiero Boetti began to make in the early 1970s involving the postal service, or for instance the work of Michelangelo Pistoletto with the very famous rugs. I think this is a quintessential work in, in that negotiation, contemporary negotiation between the effigy of classical art, the balance, the harmony, the aspirational quality of classical art, and this mountain of rugs that represents the messiness of reality, the messiness of everyday life as it is, and also um, the, the, the subtle juxtaposition between, you know, the, the very regal and, and pure uh, cloth that Venus carries with her that is about um, the quorum, it's about uh, the dignity of humanity and this pile of mess that almost smothers her elegance. So Arte Povera has always pushed the boundaries, uh, relatively short-lived as a movement, as, as some of you might remember. It runs from 1969 to 1972. And the, the, the quintessential trademark, of course, was the use of poor materials, as Arte Povera uh, implies, poor art, uh, in search of a new negotiation between ourselves and reality, in the acknowledgement that the economic boom that was experienced in Italy following the end of the Second World War had left a void, a cultural gap, a sense of alienation in the face of a country that was changing perhaps too rapidly, but not quite in the way that it was um, foreseen. Uh, the urbanization, the fast urbanization of Italy following the Second World War is central to the aesthetics and to the questions that Arte Povera poses. This is also how Arte Povera is extremely pioneering 
in the sense that he asks questions about ecology and nature and the dichotomy between nature and culture in ways that had not been asked before. Many of you will remember the art critic Germano Celand, who theorized Arte Povera, literally cherry-picking some of the artists that became quintessential to the movement, some of which we have just seen in this slide. In 1967, he published the manifesto of Arte Povera that you see here on the influential magazine Flash Art. And in this piece, he talks about the rejection of Arte Povera from the American influence of pop art and its emphasis on the serial and mass-produced, the rejection of conformism, the rejection of expensive materials that are durable because they play into a market logic that ultimately smothers through creativity in art, the rejection of categories and binaries, or at least the desire to unsettle them, and of course, the search for a new reality, a new relationality that can be more real. And that is the problem. What is the real of Arte Povera? What do Arte Povera artists look for when they begin to engage with materials, materialities and aesthetics that are in a sense uncharted, that play with the notion of the work of art by deconstructing it and reassembling it as something that is very different from the affirmative essence of classical works of art. So it is impossible to look at the work of Giuseppe Pinone in a kind of overview style or comprehensive way. And in all honesty, I wouldn't want to do that anyway, because that's not what I do. You can all access interesting documentaries or overviews of the, the artist's work and get a sense of how he engaged with nature. I have to say that most often I am left somewhat uh, dissatisfied with general overviews of the artist's work because there seems to be a, a, a kind of typical art historical tiptoeing um, around the real notion that Giuseppe Pennone is addressing, which is existentialist in essence. It's not just a discursive reconfiguration. There is a question that it's deeper at the bottom of his practice that is the result of an alienation that Giuseppe Pinone is very aware of and that is one of the very early artists to devote his practice to. Just remember how art history over centuries, starting from the 17th century, has deliberately sidelined and demoted nature as a subject not worthy of focus and engagement. To dedicate your career from the very word go, from the very beginning, as an up-and-coming artist and say, actually, I don't care about what art historians have set, the rules of the game that art history has played and that artists have followed for a few hundred years can be upturned. And I think that's one of the strengths of Giuseppe Pinone, is that commitment. So in the context of this, this presentation, I'd like to explore selected works through the lenses of ecological mythologies. Ecological mythologies are an idea that I am developing in my own writing uh, that departs and, and relies upon the theorization of William Rockert in his essay, Literature and Ecology, an experiment in ecocriticism that was published in 1996. In this essay, Rockert um, argues that uh, ecological concepts can be applied to reading, teaching, and writing about literature in order to produce what he refers to as literary ecology. For him, poems, as well as other artworks, are the equivalent of fossil fuels, stored energy. And this applies to many different cultural artifacts. But I take some of his idea and actually shift it slightly. To me, the importance of ecological mythologies 
doesn't turn artworks into fossil fuel, but it turns them into fossil stratifications, into strata of cultural sedimentations that fossilize over time, that become unchangeable and present in discourses. And the mythologies part of the ecological mythologies is very important to me because I see it in the work of Giuseppe Pinoni. I see how mythologies have always been important in human culture to explain phenomena beyond the scientific realm. Think about Greek mythology, for instance. Ways in which we acknowledge the poetic agency in the world. In other words, um, mythologies are an acknowledgement that matter is not in earth and, and that non-human beings also have agency and that they define our lives. They are interfaces that attempt to explain phenomena, experiences, perceptual iterations of our position in the world. There are ways in which we can understand phenomena and life on this planet. So there is something really powerful about mythologies. But of course, they can become the scaffold and structure around which our sense of particip participation in the world is also manifested. And yet, Western mythologies tend to anthropomorphize natural sources. And at some point, they suffocate them. Pinone's work tends to renegotiate this anthropomorphic mythologization by positioning himself and his practice in a way that more carefully respects the natural world, respects the non-human, so not to smother it, so not to obliterate it with the centrality of the human that, of course, in classical mythology is typical of the anthropocentrism of humanism. So the other strength of ecological mythologies is that they can be personal. And I think that that's another important factor in the way in which Penone articulates his practice. This idea of the personal and how I, as an individual connected to other individuals, connected to environments, can craft new mythology that are not necessarily part of a tradition that's been handed down to me, because we know that that tradition is ultimately, in a certain sense, flawed. But how can I craft a new mythology in which I am present, in which I don't always have to pass on the mic to Venus with I, or another deity that has become an institution? So a lot of what I see in Giuseppe Pinone's practice revolves around this personal negotiation. And it's not a coincidence that a lot of what the artist addresses at the beginning of his career is linked to the very notions of seeing and touching. Because those are the empirical tools we have at our disposal in order to make sense of the natural world. But of seeing, Penone says, that sight is a convention. And of course, when he says that sight is a convention, Pinone is referring to the tradition of Western scientific knowledge, the empirical system, the prominence and predominance of sight that we see taking place and shaping knowledge across Europe during the 17th and 18th century. Now, the supremacy of sight as we know, has been criticized and critiqued as limiting. This is a slippery slope. Of course, scientific knowledge is extremely important. We don't want to dismiss the importance of scientific knowledge. And for reasons that were intrinsic to the modality of epistemology, the creation, the production of knowledge of the 17th and 18th centuries, sight was deemed to be objective certainly more objective than, for instance, 
touch. So in this work, which has become like a seminal icon of Giuseppe Pinone's repertoire, uh, Rovesciare i propri occhi, which is to turn your eyes inside out, he wears custom-made contact lenses that were made in collaboration with an optician. And they are technically mirrors. They reflect the image the artist would have seen while rendering the artist blind. In a sense, they are a metaphor to the production of knowledge itself. For something that we see, we remain blind to other aspects that are unseen. And it is in this context that Pinone begins to subvert notions of objectivity and subjectivity. What we see reflected in the eyes of the artist as they are occluded by the lenses could be what the artist should have seen, but no longer is what the artist is seeing right now as he wears his lenses. And in a sense, this conception brings us to the very root of epistemology, an epistemology that in the West has made us blind to nature itself, has diminished nature to the point that it becomes uninteresting, has diminished the non-human to the point that it allows us, by implication, to claim superiority over it. It is in this context of sight as a convention that touch becomes essential in the practice of Giuseppe Pinone, not necessarily as a replacement to sight, but as a complement. Touching something, according to Pinone, is a confirmation. Touching something is a much more intimate and, of course, less objective way to develop knowledge of something else. In this work, the forest engraves the imprint of growth. You can see how the artist's fingerprints become the base of what then turns into the trunk of a tree. And it is in very early works such as these from 1969, so we're at the very beginning of what puts Pennone on the map as an archipel or artist, that we begin to see this interesting overlap which problematizes the dichotomy of nature and culture, as well as, I think, actively problematizing some conceptions that are very important today about the reconfiguring of anthropocentrism. When you think about it, in a sense, the fingerprint could be seen as thoroughly anthropocentric. There is so much ingrained in our fingerprint. And yet, Penone is not rejecting entirely the human. His desire to renegotiate implies the presence of the human. And I think in this conception, he is very much ahead of his time and very much contemporary. It makes me think of the conversations that over time developed in the context of animal studies in the humanities or uh, considerations that are still taking place in the, in the field of the environmental humanities. And in this case, you can see his acceptance that ultimately perception is linked and hardwired in us. For as much as we try and aim to decenter the human, what we see is seen by us. What we can say about the non-human is still said mostly by us. And I say mostly because in the work of Giuseppe Pinone, we find an interesting negotiation between us and materiality that ultimately invites a reconsideration that never leaves anything behind. The human, what we call nature, and that space in which the negotiations happen. So to Giuseppe Pinone, the trace, the fingerprint, has an animal quality, which is really interesting. He says the animal image, that's what he calls this imprint 
The imprint is involuntary culture. It has the intelligence of the material, a universal intelligence, an intelligence of the flesh of the material of man. The imprint of the whole epidermis of one's body, a leap into the air, a plunge into the water, the body covered with earth. Developing one's skin against the air, water, earth, rock, walls, and so on. There is something extremely poetic and very intimate about this journey that Giuseppe Penone begins in the late 60s and that remains the backbone of his practice up until today. He's still alive and kicking, producing amazing work. And this idea of negotiation is extremely important. In this work, which is called Propagazione, which translates into propagation, we see the continuity between the thumbnail that you can see in the middle of the composition. This is the thumbnail of the artist and waves that depart from it. Of course, at a glance and knowing as well Giuseppe Pinoni's body of work, we could assume that these are the concentrical circus circles that we see in the section of a tree. So again, Giuseppe Penone is trying to find a point of contact in which the identity of the tree, that as we know is ingrained into the concentrical circus, circles, is unique to each tree because, of course, the circles are defined by a number of variables that are never just reducible to the growth of the tree itself. And the same applies to our fingerprints. So Giuseppe Penone started this work with his thumb, and then he tries to extend each line at the same width of his thumb in order to create a reverberation, a sense of growth. The waves could also be understood to be sound waves in water perhaps, reaching out. They are biomorphic, abstract, and yet they remain figurative because in them we still see the circular repetition that it's typical of natural entities like trees or waves upon water. They are diagrams of the passing of time, Diagrams of the passing of time according to a natural blueprint rather than a clock. So the question of time has been ingrained in nature itself. And Giuseppe Penone also works with gold most often. And I know some of you might be thinking, what does gold have to do with the idea of Arte Povera? Well, um, Arte Povera planted the seed of Giuseppe Penone's work, the conception, then, of course, Giuseppe Penone plays with materiality, especially later on in his career, and with the notion of permanency and value in ways that expand from the initial strictures of Arte Povera itself. Of course, in this case, in the notion of gold is a notion of life. There's a primordial link to the spirituality that is so important in the tradition of gold and that we find across the history of medieval art spread across Europe and extending all the way into the East. The idea of the human and nature, the touch, the idea of working directly, there is intimacy at play, place here and we see this in early works such as these, which entail touching, which entail manipulating and engaging, as well as negotiating space with nature outside the gallery. Now, as a, as a broader context, I want to remind you about uh, the rise of land art in the United States. We've talked about pop art and how Arte Povera is resisting those cliches of pop art. In, in, the, in, in America, but 
there's also a sense that Penone engages with certain ideas that we have explored in the United States during the 1960s, but his approach cannot be aligned with the monumental and sublime gestures of Walter de Maria, for instance, or Robert Smithson. There is an intimacy and a smallness here that is dictated by the presence of his body in space. And we're going to explore this a little bit more. You can see that Giuseppe Pannone's gesture, you see him here weaving together three young trees so that they will grow together and meshed into each other, um, is much more intimate and is much more quiet. There is something that is more pensive, that's something that, in a sense, it's less patriarchal, less masculine. The gestures are not about subjugating nature by opening a canyon in the land or uh, reconfiguring a spiral jetty so that um, it changes the ecology of the bay in which it now is situated. Giuseppe Penone seems to be more respectful and yet, within this respect, there is the undeniable force, defining force of the human. In this seminal work, we find a representation of man's ability to constrict nature, perhaps. It can be read in many different ways. Man's dependency to nature can also be inscribed in this work. The reminder of not letting go, or the impossibility of not letting go. That for as much as we like to kid ourselves that nature is a backdrop, that is just a construction that ultimately prevents us from understanding our true position within the planet. An understanding that is costing us dearly today as we face almost irreversible climate change. Or the notion of time is a material that defines both nature and human intervention. The idea of growth. There is something about plants and their entwinement with time. There is a history that is indissoluble between the two. And it's a history of being present. Plants can be present in ways that humans can no longer be present. It's what ontologically, if you like, separates them in their experiencing of the world. And there is, of course, in this work also embedded the ability of nature to circumvent and to relentlessly engulf and swallow and transform whatever it, it finds in its path. So while initially it might seem to us that in this work, it's the human presence that ultimately constricts and defines. In time, it is the tree that will find ways to expel the human or incorporate it, engulf it, rather than become a passive object of it. In this relationship of touching, in this relationship of engagement, Pinone also reinvents and reconfigures the notion of mimesis as postulated in classical art from a measure with reality, a confrontation with reality, to a tool through which we can understand reality. So he replaces the heroic idea of the artist as God, emulating the creation of God with the idea of the artist who tries to understand nature through its processes and through the processes of art itself. To better understand the challenge, we need to return to one of the most famous stories that is usually uh, recounted in the 101 art history classes at all art schools uh, in the West. Uh, the myth of Zeuxis and Pharasius, the two um, very famous artists, painters from the 4th century BCE, 
unfortunately none of their works has uh, survived to us so we can just imagine that their quintessential skill was mimesis because as the myth recounts the two engaged uh, in a competition a competition that according to Pliny the Elder entailed painting something in the uttermost realism. It is said that Zeuxis created grapes, painted grapes that were so realistic that birds saw the image and flew down to attempt to eat them. You see them here coming in through the window. And shortly after, he then went to view Parasius' painting that was exhibited opposite and asked that the curtain in front of it be lifted so that he could look at the image, only to discover that the curtain was itself the painting. So Xeuxis acknowledged his defeat because while he had tricked birds, the curtain of Parasius had deceived a man, a fellow artist. So in this story, you see a hierarchy. I would actually assume that deceiving birds is a much greater accomplishment than deceiving another artist. But what this myth tell us, tells us is that classical art is grounded on this deceit, on this confrontation between artist and God. A confrontation that we know it's not consumed on a worship of reality, while at a glance or a desire to understand the natural world as reality. While at a glance, we look at these beautiful sculptures and we think that they represent the, the, the human body in anatomically correct ways, it has been proved over and over that that's not the case. The anatomy of these bodies is adjusted according to the proportional rules that dictated the beauty of classical art, the golden ratio. So, to Giuseppe Pinone, mimesis is not a confrontation with the divine. And he demonstrates this in a work that I'm going to show you in a second, of which he says that to remove a stone from the river and to return to the source of the river in order to find that stone and to work through as a sculptor to remodel the stone itself like the river did over years to him that it means that means to produce a perfect sculpture a sculpture that returns into nature and that becomes of cosmic importance. It's a really interesting concept that we see here. Now, one of the two stones is lifted from the river. The other is sculpted to look as close as possible to the, to the stone that was naturally um, shaped by the river but it's shaped by the artist. The purpose of this mimesis is not to confront himself with God and to excel, but it's actually to try and understand what it's like to become the river, if possible. And of course, there is a speculative element here that it's extremely contemporary. Those of you who are keen on uh, speculative realism or speculative approaches in philosophy can recognize this impossibility. We will never know what it's like to be a river. But what a cliche would it be to imagine that being a river has to do with being wet, right? That it has to do with water. I think that's one of the most powerful things Pannone accomplishes is to make us think about a process that the river accomplishes in ways that are not necessarily conscious in a way that human beings are conscious or our other animals are conscious and that nonetheless is the work of the river. It's a dialogue between the river and the stone that the artist is attempting to tune into and to get as close as possible as that could get. Now we see this notion of mimesis as process 
reverberate to a number of iconic works like this one, To Repeat the Forest. This is again one of my favorite works. I remember seeing it at Tate many years ago. And, you know, this is one of those that requires a lot of attention. From a distance, you just think, okay, uh, the artist cut a tree and glued it to a pedestal. And that's not what happens here. In fact, the process is a slow process of carving from a beam that once upon a time was a tree and that it's been turned into a beam. So the transformation between tree and beam by essence incorporates notions of capitalism and industrialization. You will remember that I mentioned earlier that Arte Povera emerges from the sense of alienation of a fast-changing Italy where urbanization and industrialization seem to be wiping away an identity, losing ground in a conception of what our essence is, just as quickly as the territory is being changed. And this new conception of nature is what Pannone is trying to negotiate here. The dichotomy of nature and culture as it's been handed down to us from classical art no longer stands, is no longer attainable. So there's an impossibility of reversing perhaps our processes of the rationalization of nature. Or maybe there's a desire for that process to take place, to recover, to return. There's a poetic engagement with the notion of repeating. And again, there is a notion of time sculpting these works. Pennone is studying the surface of the beam to identify knots that lead the artist back into a tree that once was, as closely as possible, and yet not just subjugating his practice, his process, to reproducing the tree exactly the way it was. The tree is an interpretation. It's in this context that Giuseppe Pennone says, I don't want to modify the material, I want to follow it. These are sentences that could come out of the mouth of contemporary artists working and engaging with these subjects today. Giuseppe Pennone is, in a sense, uh, an incredible pioneer because he is already mapping here ideas and concepts that are now central to artists who work in the context of new materialism. And you can argue that a lot of what um, Arte Povera put on the map with this desire to engage with poor materials can be contextualized retrospectively in the framework, framework of new materialism. In, this desire not to subjugate the material to do what the artist wants, but to engage with the material into a dialogue and see what the material has to say in the knowledge that the material is always saying something, unless we mute the material deliberately and intentionally, because our conception of ourselves as artists is to dominate it, is to subjugate. So you can see again this negotiation of positioning, the body of the artist, the gesture, the touching, the negotiation of a conversation that may reconfigure the dichotomy between nature and culture. You can see when you approach Ripetere il Bosco in the base, in the liminal space between the pedestal and the emergence of the tree, that there is no severance, there is no gluing, there is no rupture. The two are seamlessly connected. And this connection between nature and culture, this attempt not to reject the dichotomy, but to accept it as a continuity that if played in a certain way, doesn't smother nature, but contributes to the natural growth of the human, is central to Giuseppe Pinone's proposal. 
Some of you might remember that in 1999, it's the last century, uh, there was a devastating storm that ravaged the gardens in Versailles. Winds blowing at 130 miles an hour fell more than 10,000 trees. Now, Giuseppe Penone is also very sensitive to the sites in which he installs his work and the context in which he produces work. And it was at this time that he actually um, decided to purchase one of the largest trees that fell at the time in order to engage in this dialogue, in this dialogue that reconsidered the present and the past, what we as humans can and cannot experience about nature. There is a limit to the epistemology of science when it's based on the gaze, on sight, that renders certain things invisible, as we said earlier. And you can see how Giuseppe Pinoni's practice is archaeological sometimes. That's why I like to think about the, the ecological mythologies as stratifications of fossils. Pinoni is engaged in an excavation through carving. You can see him at work here, a careful carving of something that at a glance might appear to be just a, a different temporal dimension, but it's actually something a lot more complicated. The excavation might be happening on a non-human, on, on something we identify as natural, but it's truly an excavation in our relationship with nature, looking for something, a point of contact, a moment of connection, that goes well beyond the traditional separation between nature and culture. So this idea of proximity, this idea of touching, this idea of getting closer, returns through works like Scrigno, that translates into casket, where indexicality plays a central role in Pinone's project. In this case, what we see on the wall, it's not bark. Pinone is not interested in presenting us what we can already see in nature for what it is, because we can see that. He's interested in the negotiation. So in this case, he actually used leather to hammer a tree in order to retain the imprint of the tree itself. Again, engaging in negotiations of what's visible and invisible, what's inside and outside, reversing and confounding the two. The, the, the actual casting process, the casting process that it's so essential to the foundation of classical Greek and Roman art, is re-envisioned by Giuseppe Penone into a practice in which the cast is not necessarily lost is not discarded as a tool, but becomes part of the sculpture itself. As a process of seeing, as a process of understanding and mapping of space and bodies that otherwise remain objectified by the gaze of science. This is a process that once again began a long time ago at the beginning of Arte Povera, in the late 60s. This work is now lost. This was also part of the deliberate carelessness, lack of preciousness of the works of Arte Povera. This was a real uh, tree that was cut and that was covered by Giuseppe Pinone with wax. Little bits of wax applied across the whole of the surface, bit by bit, in order to map the years of the tree, which are, of course, inside the uh, bark, plus one. The challenge of the artist was to create a thin enough layer of wax that covered the entirety of the trunk so that it would add a year in the life of the tree 
that it's added on to it by the artist, and that could never happen because, of course, the tree is already dead. You can see in this gesture a sense of closeness, proximity, and continuation, again, between the tree and the practice, the, the um, approach of the artist. Again, a very delicate, measured, careful application of wax, which references the processes of classical art without leaving behind the original. You know, you can cast anything. Those of you who are artists know what casting does inside out. You know, you can um, cast pretty much any object. When you cover it in uh, a grease of some kind that will prevent the layers of gesso from adhering to it too much, but will allow it to adhere close enough for it to capture the essence of the object. And then when you open up the shape that has been created around it, you're left with a hollow imprint of the object itself. In classical art, once you're done creating copies and copies of the object you've cast, the cast is lost. The original object can be lost as well. Giuseppe Pinone preserves as much as possible. So this work in 2008, which is called Spazio di Luce, which translate into the space of light, is a reference, a deliberate reference to the 1969 work I just showed you the years of the tree. And in this case, the artist returns to that idea 44 years later as a 2012 Bloomberg commission at the Whitechapel Art Gallery, where I had the opportunity to work um, in the early 2000s when I lived in London. Spazio di Luce is a cast bronze that, as you can see, you might be able to see, reproduces the surface of the bark of a tree. In this case, Giuseppe Pinone applied wax to the bark of the tree, as he did in 1969, but then removed the wax as it hardened, using it to create this new surface, a new surface in which the outside of the tree no longer is its bark. If you see this work more closely, you can actually see the artist's fingerprints all over it. This is the side that he molded with his hands. The bark, the imprint of the bark, is now inside the tree itself. So there is a reversal, a reinvention of the classical casting process in which an understanding and a new knowledge of the tree is produced. This tree was encountered by the artist who was already fallen and cut into sections. And it's when he began to assemble these new casts that he decided to allow it to stand the way you see here. Because to him, it charged the tree with an agency that blurred its vegetal boundaries. It almost turned it into an animal, a creature that is actually capable of more than plants might seem capable of to us. There is something interesting about this notion of light that Giuseppe Pinone communicates through gold as well. It becomes, in a certain sense, animistic in the context of some of these sculptures. The light that the tree absorbs, that it's so essential to its life, becomes assimilated, processed within it in order to perpetuate the life of the tree itself. So this is a monumentalization of the tree, if you like. But it's a monumentalization of the tree that always acknowledges the perception from which it comes. The perception is human, and it's inscribed all over the outer surface, which 
records the imprints, the fingerprints of the artist. A very recent project by Giuseppe Penone that closed in January this year took place at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. And it's, again, an opportunity for Giuseppe Penone to strengthen this idea that nature and culture not only are not mutually exclusive, but that the two can be seen as intrinsically productive. In the display in the gallery at the library, Giuseppe Penone proceeded to use the technique of frottage, in which you apply a piece of paper or fabric to the surface of an object and then rub it with some pigment in order to capture its texture. In this case, Penone rubbed a 30 meters tall acacia tree with some vegetal pigment. You can see how this is a desire, again, to acknowledge the process, the process of learning and creating an imprint, which is specific to a tree, which then becomes surrounded, embedded, as you see here, in words. Because, of course, the tree itself is words. Think about the history of books, the history of writing in the West, and how rarely we think about books as plants. And yet, they are. How different would the history of humankind be if trees had not allowed us to spread our knowledge and disseminate it and access it at will through books. So here we see in this Alberi Libro, there are book trees that are also exhibited, that were also exhibited in the, in the show at the, at the library, really reinstating that notion, the continuity that's bound in the materiality of books. And for those of you who have not visited the library in Paris. It's just an incredible environment. I remember the first time I saw it many years ago. Um, it's astonishing. It's one of those places you stumble upon and can't, you have to pinch yourself to make sure it's real. Um, as you look down and see this beautiful forest right in the middle of the building, you're reminded about this very intimate relationship between Trees, human knowledge, book, words. There is something that cannot be left behind in this effort, in this production of knowledge. So this continuation between nature and culture, this negotiation, is something that we see at times in Giuseppe Pinone arcing back to classical materials like marble and bronze. These are trees that were created by the artist um, to be situated outside the Fendi Foundation in Rome. And you can see how enormous blocks of marble that are supported by the trees. Again, the trees are supporting our cultural production. Implicitly, return us to classical art, but they also return us to a biomorphic continuity between our veins, the branches of trees, structures of importance that are found in our bodies and in their bodies, in the architectures that have defined classical art and the mythologies of classical art, as well as the identities that we carry with us today. Even here in the United States, as I look around me, classical art still dominates as the quintessential institutional language. And you can see here Giuseppe Pinone attempting to negotiate and trace back, bring to the fore this connection. I was, I will be, I am not the contradictions that are intrinsic 
to discontinue it. So with Giuseppe Penone, we are empowered as individuals, and that is like my hope that I see in the work that any of you can take away from experiencing his work. It's this personal empowerment that we're all ultimately in charge of defining ecological mythologies that can be ours and that can allow us as individuals to reconnect to nature in ways that are wholly personal, perhaps even quirky and strange, but that can reclaim that distance, can fill that distance that science, scientific knowledge created with the prominence of the gaze in ways that are more personal. In this project that brings us back to the beginning of Giuseppe Pinone's career, you can see how the artist uses the measure of his body in order to configure a frame. And of course, a frame is such an important um, symbol in the history of Western art because the frame separates what's inside from what is outside. And it's been used as an emblem of the separation between nature and culture. And here you see the frame, which represents the presence of Giuseppe Pinone's body in space, being immersed, violated by the river, by the water that it's ultimately impossible to contain. But you see his presence, his presence symbolized and magnified as an absence, an absence that nonetheless is not irrelevant. The measure that Penone inserts in the landscape, it's not a measure of subjugation. It's an existentialist question. It's a question that brings us back to our relationship with nature. What we have missed and what can be reclaimed through levels of intimacy that we can craft once again. This is the last work I want to briefly share with you tonight, and it's called Soffio di Foglie, which is Breath of Leaves. And it's a floor sculpture of myrtle leaves that um, Giuseppe Pinone started to stage in 1979 and still restages today. As you can see, it's a mound of leaves upon which he lays, and of course, as you can imagine, he doesn't spend the entirety of the exhibition laying down flat on these leaves. He turns to one side and he sighs across the leaves in order to create space across them. And the resulting um, work is this imprint of the body of the artist. Again, the presence and the absence the notion of life and death, the notion of the passing of time and a trace, a trace that once again is not the intrusive and aggressive trace of land art of the 1960s in America, but it's a subtle trace. It's a trace that doesn't damage the environment. It's a trace that it's temporary. And as such, it's connected to memory, but not in the sense of the monumentalization of memory, as in the heroic memory of, look what I have accomplished. Posterity will remember me looking at this. What we see here is a form of writing with nature and through nature that rejects notions of permanence and that embraces the fluidity, that embraces the becoming, the passing, the instability of natural processes. Thank you.